Hi, I'm John McCoy, Assistant Director of Multimedia and Design Services at the McMullen Museum of Art and co-curator of the exhibition American Alternative Comics 1980 to 2000, Raw, Weirdo and Beyond, currently on view at the McMullen. I welcome you all to this museum current event featuring curator Caitlin McGurk. The museum current series is organized by Rachel Chamberlain, the McMullen's Manager of Education, Outreach, and Digital Resources. This series of talks features museum professionals and focuses upon issues in museums, collections, and exhibitions. For tonight's installment, our guests will focus on issues particular to the collection, preservation, and presentation of comics in their various forms, including original art and, print and printed materials. Caitlin McGurk is the curator of comics and cartoon art and an associate professor at the Ohio State University Billy Ireland Cartoon Library and Museum in Columbus, Ohio. She leads the comics education and outreach efforts of the library, manages publicity and community events, and curates exhibition. Caitlin has also done work for the Center for Cartoon Studies, that's right up here in New Hampshire, uh, Schultz Library, Columbia University, and Marvel Comics. She has written for the Diamond Comics Bookshelf uh, magazine for educators and librarians, published her own comics, and serves on the council for the annual festival, Cartoon Crossroads Columbus. McGurk's research and scholarship is on women in comics, alternative and underground comics, and early comic strips. Some of her recent articles and book chapters include Lovers, Enemies, and Friends, the complex encoded early history of lesbian comic strip characters for the Journal of Lesbian Studies, and Comics in Special Collections, purposeful collection development for promoting inclusive history for Library Juice Press. Recent exhibitions include Ladies First, A Century of Women's Innovations in Comics and Cartoon Art, and Tell Me a Story Where the Bad Girl Wins, The Life and Art of Barbara Sherman. She's currently working on a book about Barbara Sherman, which will be published by Fantagraphics Books in 2024. Caitlin was also enormously generous with her time when I first saw Williams for the McMullen's Alternative Comics Exhibition showing me and my wife Marina through the Billy Ireland Comic Library and Museum's collections and helping me locate a crucial core group of loans from her institute's uh, enormous collections. She lent her expertise by suggesting works and artists, and she has been encouraging and gracious with her knowledge and advice on the several occasions that I have asked her for advice while planning the exhibition. And so now I'm pleased to turn the microphone over to our guest, Caitlin McKirk. Hi everyone, thank you so much, John, and thank you all for attending and for inviting me here. This is really exciting for me. It was a, it was a pleasure to get to, to get work with you a bit, John, on the exhibit, and I really wish that I could come see it in person myself. Uh, so yes, I'm Caitlin, and I am the Curator of Comics and Cartoon Art at the Billy Ireland Cartoon Library and Museum, which is the largest collection of comics and cartoon art in the entire world. Um, what I mean when I say that we are the world's largest is that our collection at the Billy Ireland has over 3 million pieces that totals to over about 300 sorry that uh, includes um, over 300,000 pieces of original art, whether it's the original pages from Marvel and DC Comics or underground comic books like the ones that John borrowed, or political cartoons dating back to the 16 and 1700s, comic strip art, um, Disney animation original art, everything in between. About 75,000 books, most of which are graphic novels or books about uh, cartoon art history. 50,000 comic books, mini comics and zines, over 6,000 boxes of manuscript material. So that's all the paperwork related to a cartoonist's life and career. For a lot of famous cartoonists, we collect things like all of their uh, fan mail and hate mail and contracts and receipts and the kind of material that gives our researchers a sense of what that uh, artist's personal life was like, um, what their business dealings were like and how re the readership may have been responding to their work. Uh, we also have a collection of 2.5 million comic strip clippings and tear sheets. A tear sheet is the term for a whole page of the newspaper that's been torn out. 
That collection was amassed by one person uh, in their home before it came to us, and I'll be talking about it uh, quite a bit further along in my presentation. We also collect ephemera and more. Um, as you guys, I'm sure know, um, merchandising is a huge part of pop culture. And so our collection has uh, comics merchandise dating uh, well back into the 1800s, as well as some really unique ephemera, like what we believe to be some of the first handmade cosplay costumes dating back into the 1940s. Um, so this, uh, this collection is massive. And in my presentation today, I'm going to be kind of uh, talking about various facets of it. I know that uh, most of you are here from a museum studies standpoint, but really um, the museum is just one part of what we do here. So the Billy Ireland has three functions. Uh, in general, it is a special collection library that is part of the Ohio State University's library system. We're one of nine special collections libraries. If you're not familiar with that term, a special collection is essentially an archive that collects around a special topic area. And our topic area, of course, is comics and cartoon art. So we are really um, uh, in place to um, collect and preserve the history of cartoon art in all of its forms and you know, the various types that I've mentioned uh, previously. Our other function is as a library. So OSU is a, um, a land grant institution, meaning it's a, it's a public university and all of the libraries at OSU, including the special collections like the Billy Ireland are also open to the public. So our reading room, which is where anyone can come into and request and view all the materials in our collection is also a really essential uh, service that we provide. And then the third tier would also be the museum, which is what I'm going to um, be focusing on a little bit more today, but while covering all different aspects of this together. Again, since I know some of you guys are uh, museum studies students or otherwise interested in, in the, this program, um, I wanted to just briefly mention uh, our staffing structure. Um, as a library and archive and a museum, uh, we have a massive undertaking. And again, being the largest collection in the world is a lot of material to deal with. And yet we have about six full-time people. So uh, we are a really small staff pulling off um, some, what I think is pretty miraculous work. Um, and this is just a general overview of, of our structure. So uh, we have a head curator and then it branches out underneath her. Uh, I'm the out, I'm what you could consider the outreach curator. I do all the public facing work for the most part. Um, our collections work uh, curator um, works on processing collections and, um, uh, managing loans and things like that. And then our reading room manager uh, deals with patrons and research requests in our reading room. And then under each of us, we also uh, kind of branch out from there in, in, other, in other roles. Uh, so my role in particular, uh, John mentioned a few things that I do. I'm really focused on everything kind of public facing for the museum. So I curate many of the exhibitions. I teach classes at Ohio State. Um, a really a wonderful thing about um, where I work is that all of the curators for the special collections at OSU are also given faculty status. So I had to undergo the, the tenure process and just received tenure last year. So I do uh, teach on a, on a faculty level at OS, OSU. Um, I also manage all of our events, whether they're uh, workshops with the Girl Scouts of America, who can earn a, a, girl, uh, a comic artist badge, or um, bringing in famous cartoonists to give master classes, uh, organizing panels of comic scholars and things like that, and many virtual programs too that we've started to do. Uh, another facet of my job that I really love is donor relations. So um, we rely almost entirely on donations to build our collection. And I don't just mean financial donations, but the material donation. So about 90% of our collections have just been donated to us by artists themselves or by collectors or family members of, of cartoonists. So I um, build sort of almost you know lifelong relationships with cartoonists who are considering eventually leaving their material to us. I do a lot of studio visits. Visits, um, when someone is planning to actually move forward with um, giving us their work, I'll often go to someone's house and pack everything up myself and work with them directly to make sure that we are um, representing uh, their work when we catalog it the way that they would like us to. I also handle all the marketing, outreach, and communications uh, and social media for our library um, and do uh, public, uh, public presentations that raise awareness for us like this one. So 
uh, that's a little bit about kind of the the general stuff that goes on the Billy Island, the structure of of who we are and what we do. And I'm happy to answer questions about all of this stuff uh, towards the end. But now I want to kind of dive into just talking about comics and talking about the kind of stuff we collect, uh, because that will help you guys uh, eventually get a sense of um, of of how we curate our exhibits here. So I'm going to talk to you guys first about the history of the Billy Ireland, uh, the major people involved, a little bit about what we do in the museum, the uh, the types of materials we have here and some highlights from it. And then we'll circle back to talking about some of the challenges of curating exhibits in particular with this work. So to sort of set the scene for talking about comics uh, in, a, in an institutional um, a place like at MSU, I'm going to enlist the help of uh, Bill Watterson's Calvin and Hobbes. So I'll read this comic to you guys. A painting, moving, spiritually enriching, sublime, high art, the comic strip, vapid, juvenile, commercial hack work, low art. A painting of a comic strip panel, sophisticated irony, philosophically challenging, high art. Suppose I draw a cartoon of a painting of a comic strip, sophomoric, intellectually sterile, low art. So what Bill Watterson, the creator, is trying to say here through Calvin and Hobbes um, is uh, giving some perspective on the way that comics have historically been perceived, which really um, plays a big role in some challenges that we as an institution have faced throughout our history and trying to build this place into, into what it is now. Um, you guys may be picking up on the reference here with a, a, paint, a painting of a comic strip referring um, particular to Roy Lichtenstein, who I'll be talking about a little bit further along um, in this presentation. So we're really proud of the fact that at OSU, we were one of the first institutions in the entire world to actually create this long disrespected art form with the respect that it actually deserves. Um, people have historically thought that comics were really made just for the masses, made for entertainment purposes, and really um, when they first appeared in newspapers in the, early, in the late 1800s, were just there to sell the newspapers, were there to make more money. So again, it's really important to us that we kind of broke ground with changing the perception of it. Uh, the way that began was with a uh, with this this little guy. This is a baby photo of a very very important artist named Milton Kniff. Uh, Milton Kniff uh, is the essentially the founder of our library. Um, this is him many many years after that first photo um, in 1975. If you're not familiar with Kniff, Kniff was one of the most um, influential and and well regarded cartoonists in American history. The two comic strips he was most famous for were called Terry and the Pirates and Steve Canyon. And these were adventure comic strips that ran during like the heyday of American newspaper comics. Um, back in his day, he was kind of a household name. Uh, his comics were widely licensed and merchandised and turned into radio shows and, you know, all kinds of things. Um, his his height of popularity was really from the 1930s uh, through the 1960s, um, but the, the 30s through the 50s in particular was really when Kniff was, was in his prime. Um, but before becoming this really famous cartoonist, Milton Kniff was a student at Ohio State. So he went to school here at OSU in Columbus in the 1920s. Graduated in 1930, went on to, um, you know, find great success as a newspaper cartoonist, and then in the 1970s, when he started to retire from cartooning, felt that he owed the success of his career to his education at OSU and decided to donate his life's work to us. Um, that's how we were initially founded, and this is a, a photo of Milton Kniff with our founding curator, Lucy Shelton Caswell. Now, a couple of things about this, this time period. Despite the fact that Kniff was this extremely well-regarded, famous American cartoonist, when he decided to donate his life's work to Ohio State, the OSU libraries actually turned him down because they did not think that comics were worth saving and they didn't even know what to do with this material. This was, you know, before graphic novels had really been 
you know, invented or, or popularized at least, and people were not keeping this kind of material in libraries yet. So the libraries turned the collection down, which is again, pretty embarrassing, but luckily because of the connection to newspapers, since it was a newspaper strip he was famous for, the journalism department at OSU accepted his collection. And that's actually where we initially began. So Lucy Caswell was a librarian in the journalism uh, department, and she recognized the importance of this material. So over the next 10 years of Milton Kniff's life, she worked with him closely to um, establish the cartoon library and to encourage his contemporaries to also start sending us their material. And we've grown exponentially since then, as I'll get into uh, in a bit. Just to touch a little bit more, uh, a little bit more on Milton Kniff's work, this is an example of an original page of his artwork. Uh, Terry and the Pirates was his first kind of breakthrough comic in the newspapers. Um, if you're not familiar with uh, early newspaper comics, which I don't, you know, expect anyone to be, um, you might not know that. You know, back in the day, the comic section in any given newspaper in the United States was eight to 10 pages long on a Sunday, very different than how it looks now. And uh, on a Sunday, a cartoonist could have up to an entire page of their own in the paper. So this is what one, uh, this is what one day's strip of uh, Terry and the Pirates would have looked like. Um, Terry and the Pirates was an adventure comic strip. Uh, it started in the 1930s and took place in the Mysterious Orient. And so it's got uh, lots of extremely racist stuff in here, which was unfortunately very uh, standard for uh, pop culture at the time. Um, to give you a sense of how talented Kniff was, he was doing you know, the writing, the research, the penciling, the lettering, the inking, you know, every aspect of one of these of this, one of these seven days a week for decades at a time, while uh, also um, ghosting other comic strips as well. He was just an incredibly, incredibly gifted artist. Um, he was known for his use of chiaroscuro. Uh, he was one of the first cartoonists to really bring cinematic uh, elements into the comics. So many newspaper comics before this time, and even many today, often kind of look like flat characters, you know, in profile or facing us, you know, moving across a plane. Kniff was one of the first artists to really change what you could think of as the camera angle from panel to panel and expand the world that his art, uh, that his storylines existed in and make and give it this sort of almost film noir feeling. So uh, his art style really became known as the school of Kniff and he was massively influential on many other artists who came. Uh, after him. Just to kind of drive home the impact that he was having, since I know there's some students here and he's way before our time, I don't expect many folks to, to know who he was. Um, I'll just briefly mention um, the type of stuff that we sometimes find in our manuscript material. So I said earlier that that's the paperwork related to an artist's life and career. Um, in Milton Kniff's manuscript material, we've came, come across things like this. This is a fan letter written to Milton Kniff from John Steinbeck in 1942. So John Steinbeck is the you know, writer of Mice and Men and Grapes of Wrath, one of the most important literary figures in history, writing a fan letter that is um, very saucy. If anyone has started reading it, it's a bit inappropriate, so I'm not going to read it out loud here. And it's about Steinbeck's... Um, you know, sexual feelings for uh, this character, the dragon lady. Uh, but we find stuff like this in our collection uh, all the time. And again, sharing that um, just to show the impact that Kniff had at his time. And also the fact that even though we're a visual art archive, primarily the manuscript materials have some really exciting and cool things in them. So anyway, Moving forward to our to our space itself and the impact um, of the the early folks who were involved in it, when we were first founded, uh, again with Milton Kniff's collection, it was just called the Milton Kniff Reading Room, and this is what it looked like. It was just two converted classrooms in uh, the the journalism building. Um, you can see our you know old school uh, computer system here and telephone wire hanging down from the ceiling. So very humble beginnings. So this was again back in uh, 1977. Um, by 1989, we had outgrown this space and moved into this facility. Um, this was a basement facility um, where we had about 5,000 5, square feet for our collection. Um, our museum at this time was really, as you can see here, the reading room walls where we would just pin up small exhibits in them. So pretty, pretty modest, very hard to find location. It was not, not great. Um, and we were down there. Um, 
until uh, just recently. So since uh, since our um, uh, our founding in 1977, we've had all of these different names. And in 2009, we changed our name to the Billy Ireland Cartoon Library and Museum when we received a gift that uh, helped us move into our new facility that I'm gonna sh be showing you guys pictures of in a bit. Um, we're now named after Billy Ireland, who uh, was a very important cartoonist who um, was uh, based here in Columbus. Um, this is the cover of our local newspaper when Billy Ireland died. It's a it's a full uh, page front cover obituary for a cartoonist showing his impact. He was the lead cartoonist for the Columbus Dispatch um, from the late 1800s until uh, he passed away in 1939. This is a, an image of what his uh, comic strip looked like that he did every single Sunday. It was called The Passing Show, and it was essentially an editorial cartoon about everyday life in central Ohio. Um, he was uh, really impactful on local issues as well as national issues as well. He fought hard for women's right to vote. Um, he was considered the man who laughed the KKK out of central Ohio because he'd regularly feature the Klan as the butt of his jokes in his cartoons. So really, um, really amazing guy. Um, but one of the but the reason he's so important to us at OSU and the reason he got involved with our or his family got involved with our library is that he was our founding donors mentor. So when Milton Kniff, that artist who did Terry and the Pirates, who founded our library in the 70s, when that when that um, artist was a student at OSU in the 1920s, Billy Ireland hired Kniff for his very first cartooning job over at the Columbus Dispatch while he was still attending college here. Uh, Kniff considered Ireland to be like a father figure and mentor for the rest of his life. And so when Ireland's family got involved with us, with our library, and wanted to make um, a donation that would help us expand our facilities, it made perfect, beautiful sense for us to be named for our founding donors mentor. Um, this is actually uh, the piece of artwork that Milton Kniff did for Billy Ireland to convince him to hire him back in the 1920s when he was a student at Ohio State. And the gift that um, that Billy Ireland's family gave us allowed us to expand into the facility we are today. So the gift came in 2009 and, tw and in 2013, we were able to expand into this beautiful building. Uh, we are now at the gateway to campus on at OSU um, in a building called Solvent Hall that was completely gutted for our renovation. We went from having 5,000 square feet for our space to now having 40 over 40,000 square feet. So this is a major, major expansion for us. Very exciting. And I'll show you guys some images of what it looks like. Um, and if you ever get to come visit, I'll give you a tour. So uh, we were able to um, expand our storage space, which really is, takes up the majority of, um, of our square footage at um, uh, in Solvent Hall. Um, all of our material is kept, bleh, kept in a um, environmentally controlled uh, archive. So, you know, kept at a steady temperature and humidity, monitored 24 hours a day. Um, all the lighting is non-UV ray lighting. It's a very high security archive. Um, you need swipe access to get back there, which only a few people have. If the door to the archive stays open for more than 60 seconds, the police are automatically called. So it's very, um, it's very well protected. Um, We've got a digital imaging lab at our as part of our uh, facilities now, where we are able to make super high resolution scans of as much of our collection as possible. Um, we use this uh, facility to um, to populate an image database on our website, where we currently have thirty thousand super high res uh, cartoon art images available for the public to to peruse. But another thing that we use this for is uh, really the the one way that we generate revenue for our collection. So um, many uh, publishing houses reproduce uh, collections of comic strips and graphic novels and things like that. And if we hold those um, items in our collection, the original art for them, they will come to us and pay us a fee uh, for the high resolution scans. And that's how we generate some funding to hire students for our library. Uh, we have a classroom space called the Will Eisner Seminar Room at our library um, and a 300 seat theater called the uh, Gene and Charles Schultz Lecture Hall. So these are where we do a lot of our education effort, out, uh, education efforts and um, and public programs as well. And of course, our reading room that I mentioned earlier, where we are able to give 
anyone from anywhere access to our collection. Uh, since we are a special collection and we've got such rare material, we don't, of course, allow people to take items home with them. So we're a non-circulating collection. But everything we have with, with very few um, uh, exceptions is fully available to, for anyone to make an appointment and view in our reading room. Um, but best of all, with the move into this new building a few years ago, we were able to add on an actual state-of-the-art museum. So this, these are some shots of our museum galleries. We have uh, three galleries in here. Uh, the first one shown in this photo is our Treasures Gallery. It's our museum's permanent collection gallery. It's basically a greatest hits exhibit. Um, it changes over uh, only every few years, but we generally keep the same uh, themes present in it. So in this show, we try to show, uh, we try to highlight, you know, the best of what we have, but also items that um, that show the whole chronology of cartoon art. And um, it's kind of a, a good like teaching and learning space for getting the basics of, um, of the history of this art form. We also have two other gallery spaces and exhibits that rotate through them. Some other shots of those. Uh, we curate up to six exhibits per year uh, uh, with a wide variety of themes and, and goals. And I'll just briefly kind of go over some of the types of exhibits that we do. So themed exhibits, uh, an example of that could be Good Grief, Children and Comics, which we mounted a few years ago. Uh, in the picture on the left there is Jean Schultz, who is the widow of Charles Schultz, the creator of Peanuts. Uh, the Schultz family are, are pretty major donors to our library, and uh, we were able to curate an exhibit that highlighted um, children's roles in as characters in comics throughout history. Uh, the gentleman on the right is um, Gene Yang, uh, the uh, cartoonist behind American Born Chinese, uh, one of the um, most successful young adult graphic novels of, of recent years. We do often uh, curate retrospectives or a single creator exhibits, such as Didini, The Art of Humor. And that actually was an exhibit uh, that was mostly of Playboy cartoons. So um, Eldon Didini was known as a, a men's magazine cartoonist primarily. And um, we, uh, you know, we try to show things that run the whole gamut of, of uh, what is important in the cartoon art field. Or ex on the far other end of the spectrum, exploring Calvin and Hobbes. Um, I'll talk about Calvin and Hobbes a little bit more later, but I will mention now that um, the Bill Watterson collection is probably the one we're most internationally known for. Um, the creator of Calvin and Hobbes, Bill Watterson, has donated all of his work to Ohio State. So we have everything he's almost ever drawn, including his childhood works uh, here at the Billy Ireland. We do exhibits that celebrate particular collections, such as Wordless, the collection of David Barona. This was a collection specifically of, of wordless books that we focused on. Or exhibits celebrating a particular anniversary, such as the Long March Civil Rights in, cartoon, in Cartoons and Comics, which we mounted um, for, during the 50th anniversary of the a civil rights movement. And pictured here, some folks may recognize Congressman John Lewis, who, um, was uh, at, at this time heavily involved in, in the uh, graphic novel trilogy March that told his story in the civil rights movement. And we were able to highlight that, uh, the original art from that book in our collect in our exhibit. So he and the uh, other creators of it came out to see our show. We occasionally do touring exhibits, but not very often. Um, two examples are graphic details, confessional comics by Jewish women, and windows on death row, art from inside and outside prison walls. Um, so I'll jump into exploring collections in a bit, in, in, a, in a minute, but just to wrap up um, some notes about the, the exhibits that we host and curate. Um, I'll mention that our museum is completely free and open to the public. It's one of the only free museums um, in Columbus where, where we're based. And it's really there to serve, you know, the general public, since we are a, public, a land grant institution, but also, um, you know, classes and faculty members as well. So we work with about 60 classes per year um, that we will bring on, you know, uh, individual tours of our exhibits. Um, we also work with community groups that can come in and make appointments with us. We do not have a docent program. I wish we did. I'll talk more about that uh, towards the end. Uh, so otherwise, it's really um, the individual curators who work on these shows, most of which are myself and the other uh, and the other curator at the at the library. Um, though we occasionally are able to partner with faculty members across OSU to co-curate exhibits with us. 
So now to talk about the kind of stuff that gets put into these exhibits. And um, in order to do that, I'm going to kind of go through a uh, hopefully fun highlights reel of the type of stuff that we have in our collection and just look at some cool art and learn a little bit about comics history along the way. So I'll start with our original, some highlights from our original art collection. Um, one of the earliest collections to come to us after Milton Kniff founded our library was the Will Eisner collection. Um, Will Eisner is kind of known as the um, grandfather of the graphic novel. That's the thing that his, is oftentimes his, his uh, claim to fame. Um, really, Will Eisner was the first cartoonist to popularize the graphic novel format with a um, book that he created called The Contract with God. Um, this was in the 19, late 1970s. He went on to create over 20 graphic novels throughout his career. But he's more significant um, to us for being somebody who touched almost every aspect of comics history. He worked in newspaper comics, he created an early comic book, which this is uh, an example of. This is from uh, The Spirit. Um, he uh, became a um, educator in comics. So he taught at the uh, School of Visual Arts in New York City and was one of the first people to really teach with uh, with comics and graphic novels. And we have his complete collection, including his childhood artwork, his teaching materials, and all things in between at the, at the Billy Ireland. Um, I mentioned Peanuts earlier. Uh, as I said, the Schultz family are big donors to our museums. We have quite a lot of Peanuts original art here. Um, we actually just closed an exhibit that we had up since the spring called Celebrating Sparky. That was a uh, exhibit celebrating Charles Schultz's 100th birthday. His nickname was Sparky. Though I will also plug, um, if anyone has ever gets a chance to visit the Schultz Museum in Santa Rosa, California, that's where the majority of his collection is kept, and it's really a, a phenomenal museum. Um, the uh, Schultz Museum and the Cartoon Art Museum in, in San Francisco in addition to the Billy Ireland, are the only comics museums in the country. Uh, the Walt Kelly collection was another early one that came to our library. Uh, Walt Kelly is the creator of the comic strip called Pogo. Um, this was immensely popular in the 1950s to the 1970s, and it's what we would call a funny animal comic, which is a very technical term for comics that featured animal characters. Um, Pogo, though, uh, despite its um, uh, approachable look, uh, it was actually a very heavy comic that often dealt with um, things related to uh, uh, politics and philosophy. Um, the phrase, we have met the enemy and he is us, which has to do with how we you know, treat our environment, treat our earth, actually came from this comic strip. So it was a really significant one in its day. Um, if any of you are reading through this example, you can see that um, he also was a cartoonist who sort of broke the fourth wall and played with what we call meta comics, which are self-referential -refer comic strips. Um, we have collections of uh, uh, both um, cartoonists and comics writers as well. So uh, the P. Craig Russell collection is a very popular one at the library. Uh, many people are not aware of P. Craig Russell by name, but they are aware of his biggest collaborator, Neil Gaiman. So um, folks on this call might know Neil Gaiman from American Gods or from um, uh, the Sandman series. He's one of the most prolific um, contemporary uh, sort of science fiction writers, but also a major collaborator with cartoonists on graphic novels. And since we have the P. Craig Russell collection here, we also have Neil Gaiman's scripts for the comics that they've worked on together. So when we have researchers and students who are interested in seeing the process of how creating a work in collaboration um, can come together, they're able to see all the different elements of it in our collection. I mentioned Calvin and Hobbes being our most popular collection, um, and uh, that is certainly true. Um, we have uh, some of the earliest examples. Well, we have since we have all of Calvin and Hobbes, we have work that dates back to when Bill Watterson was first just pitching the comic um, before the characters came to look as they eventually would. So here's a very exam early example of it and a much later example of it. Um, one of the things that Bill Watterson was best known for doing with Calvin and Hobbes was getting uh, the newspaper syndicates to give him complete creative control over his cartoons. So um, if you think about how most standard comic strips look in a newspaper, they've got that long title panel and then the boxy shorter panels after that. 
Um, people often think that's just what comics look like and that cartoonists choose to draw that way, but that is not true. So if we if we if you think back to the Terry and the Pirate strip we saw earlier when a cartoonist had a whole page of their own to experiment with, those days are long gone. And as the comics pages shrank, um, newspapers started to require cartoonists to work in that boxy format so that they could shrink the comic strip down as small as they want. Everything would stay to scale and they could shove as many more advertisements or whatever other information on the page. Calvin and Hobbes started in that format, but eventually it reached such major success that when it came time for Bill Watterson to renew his contract with the newspaper syndicates, he said, I'm just going to stop drawing it unless you give me complete creative control over my design. And since it was so popular, they let him do it. And we were able to get some beautiful uh, works from him like this one that really show how, you know, the subject matter and the, and the format itself can be speaking to each other. Um, the Jeff Smith collection uh, is also a really important one to us at Ohio State. Jeff Smith is the creator of Bone uh, and Razzle. Um, two extremely successful young adult uh, graphic novel series. Um, Jeff Smith is also the president of Cartoon Crossroads Columbus, which is a festival we have here annually in, in, uh, in our city. Um, I would say second to our comic strip collection, our biggest sort of area of original art that we have is political cartoons. Um, these two examples here are uh, from Black Press cartoonists, uh, Sam Malai and Oliver Harrington. Um, the Black Press, which still exists today, these were newspapers created by and for African-American communities. And Sam Malai and Oliver Harrington were two of the most significant um, Black Press cartoonists working, especially in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, <clears throat> you can see that these are two examples of work from back then that speak to very current uh, issues that are still discussed today, from police, police brutality um, to gun control. Mm -hmm. Uh, another collection that we have done a great deal of exhibitions about and uh, and writing on is the Edwina Dumb collection. Edwina Dumb ties into the political cartoons that we have. She was um, the very first female political cartoonist in the United States and worked for a newspaper here in Columbus, Ohio. Um, mentioning also, again, to re-mention what we uh, have in our manuscript materials, for some cartoonists, we have things like all of their diaries, and that's the case for this particular artist. So we have um, about 30 diaries by this uh, that were kept by this cartoonist when she was becoming the first woman political cartoonist, and then a very success successful comic strip artist later on in her career. Um, we've got uh, humor magazine art, of course. So um, a few years ago, we did a great exhibit about Mad Magazine. And these are some um, original pieces from the cartoonist Al Jaffe, who was uh, who created the Mad Fold-In feature that would run uh, towards the back of Mad, Mad Magazine every single issue. These are some examples from that. And then moving to super contemporary stuff, um, we are really proud to have uh, what we believe to be the biggest representation of original art by um, trans and non-binary cartoonists. Um, Edie Fake is uh, the cartoonist behind a really important graphic novel called Gaylord Phoenix, which was uh, the first graphic novel to really um, discuss elements of transition. Um, and um, we have Edie Fake's collection, Carter O'Neill's collection, and um, and uh, uh, Catherine Collins collection as well. So we've been working on um, plans for an exhibit about uh, queer cartoonists for the near future. Um, <clears throat> I wanna tell a few stories kind of throughout uh, talking about our collections. And one of them is about uh, the cartoonist Windsor McKay. Um, Windsor McKay is best known as an early fantasy cartoonist um, for uh, with, who created Little Nemo in Slumberland. He was also a um, early animator. Um, the image on the left is from his film, Gertie the Dinosaur. And the piece on the right, which is of course, you know, extremely racist and has some blackface imagery in it, is from his very first feature, which was called Tale of the Jungle Imps. Now at this point, you know, Windsor McKay is, uh, is one of the most um, respected and um, beloved artists in, in cartoon history. Um, because in particular of uh, his work on Gertie the Dinosaur and Little Nemo in Slumberland. But he got his start doing this other uh, 
comic feature for the Cincinnati Inquirer um, back in 1903. I won't give you guys the entire history of it, but I want to talk just briefly about some of the interesting ways in which items have come to our collection. So because this this cartoonist is so famous and there's there's been, you know, multiple biographies written about him um, and it was known that this was his first uh, comic strip feature, but it was thought that no pieces of original art from it had survived time um, and, and none, none had ever uh, been saved or seen by any museums or libraries. Um, in 2011, we received a phone call at the Billy Ireland from a, a local woman who said, you know, I just found this box of old um, doodles in my great grandfather's attic and I have no idea what they are. Like if, if, if I could come in and show them to you, maybe you could tell me what they are. And if not, if you don't have time, I'll just throw them in the garbage. And we get calls like this frequently. We do rely on donations. So we're usually able to give everybody a chance and see what they have to show us. She came in and opened up this folder and in it were 13 of the only surviving pieces of original art from Windsor McKay's very first comic feature, Tale of the Jungle Imps, which again, this is an example of on the right. We identified it immediately um, and we and she was kind enough to donate five of them to us and the rest sold for $50,000 a piece. So this was, you know, this is a piece of comics history that was about to go in the garbage and the reason I share that is to give some perspective on how much of it probably has gone in the garbage. Um, since this is an art form that has long not been treated with a tremendous amount of respect and people often don't know what to do with it, a lot of it has been completely lost to history. Um, we're really glad when people think to contact us and, uh, and add items like this to our collection because otherwise um, so much of it could be lost uh, forever. Um, I want to also briefly mention because of the animation art that is on the left here, we do collect, uh, we don't um, comprehensively collect animation. Uh, there's actually no library or archive that is completely is, is trying to comprehensively collect animation art just because there's too much material. Um, but since we rely on donations, we've received quite a lot of animation in larger collections of comic art. And so we have about uh, 500 boxes of uh, essential animation, original art from people like um, Disney, as well as the Fleischer brothers and, and more. Um, the last piece, uh, the last kind of area of original art I'll mention, of course, ties to the exhibit that's up right now, which is um, uh, the underground comics art that we have. Um, this is a piece of original art by Robert Crumb and Aileen Kaminsky Crumb, his wife. Um, they're both uh, really essential cartoonists from the underground movement and uh, collaborated quite frequently. Uh, if anyone has not seen um, John's exhibit or isn't familiar with this uh, work, this was um, in the night from the 1960s at a time that was considered when uh, the era that comics grew up. So underground comics, comics with an X, uh, this was a time where utilizing um, things like more DIY, uh, access to more DIY technologies, cartoonists were able to self-publish their own work and tell stories that were more personal and political and covering types of things that had not previously been exposed through the comics format, which prior to the 1960s had mostly been focused on superhero comics and, you know, romance comics and mysteries and things like that. So, um, <clears throat> an essential part of the history. So I'm just going to briefly go over some of the types of comic books that we collect and highlight in our exhibits. Um, I said we have about 50,000 comic books. Um, Michigan State University actually is trying to comprehensively collect every single comic book that had ever been has ever been published. Um, we're in a consortium with them at our library, and we don't personally um, focus entirely on comic books since that's what they're doing and we don't want to duplicate that labor so we um, more frequently than not uh, will direct comic book donations to Michigan State and instead we consider the 50,000 we have to be a nice representative sample of some important comic books so things that that might include uh, would be you know comic books that pertain to major um, historical and political events this is Marvel Comics, September 1941, with the Human Torch battling the Nazis. Um, All Negro Comics, the very first comic book to be in, to be published entirely by um, Black creators. Air Pirates Funnies. This was an underground comic that sort of uh, was a, a parody of uh, of Disney comics and created a massive lawsuit between underground cartoonists and the Disney Corporation. 
It Ain't Me, Babe, the first comic book to be published entirely by women in 1970, which happened pretty late. Um, and different uh, types of comic books, such as girls' romance comics, which were um, which were really popular in the 1940s and 50s. Um, they were created really just to sell more comic books since the primary readership had been boys. Uh, comic book companies thought, well, let's try to make you know lines that are entirely about things that girls would want to read, like nursing and romance and army men. And of course, these comic books were made entirely by male creators as well. So they're very soap opera-ish, interesting, campy part of comics history. Uh, horror comics, big part of our collection, of course. Um, and then more political leaning comic books, um, things like Abortion Eve from the 1970s. It was one of the first or it was the first comic book to cover issues about um, women's reproductive rights. Um, shifting into other areas of our collection, our manuscript materials include, um, uh, as I said, letters and paperwork that belong to a cartoonist. Um, one of the uh, collections that I like to highlight that we have is um, the Lynn Johnston collection. So some of you might be familiar with this comic strip for better or for worse. It's still running as I think reruns in the newspaper today. Uh, Lynn Johnston is a um, Canadian uh, cartoonist and she was really innovative um, in, in this comic strip for better or for worse for having her characters age in real time, meaning that unlike in something like um, Peanuts or Garfield, uh, the characters actually get older and because they're getting older, some of them occasionally get sick and pass away. Um, we have Lynn Johnston's collection and one of the first occasions in which she wrote a character's death into her comic strip was the family dog Farley, who had been a lot, who had been part of the strip for about 13, 14 years. And so if it had been a real dog and that's what she was trying to portray was reality, it would have um, uh, possibly, it would have died. So she wrote his death into the strip and in her collection, we have over 2000 letters written to her just about her killing off this dog. So uh, the manuscript materials are a, a really fascinating thing to get to mine, to see the way that, um, uh, again, readership is responding to this kind of stuff, the effect that it's having, you know, these are, there's a sympathy card for this fictional dog. Um, people who were quite angry about her doing this and also people who were really grateful that she wrote this uh, compassionate storyline in and maybe they had gone through something like that with their own family recently and found it cathartic to read. So all kinds of uh, fascinating stuff that we've we've come across. Um, I'm going kind of rapid fire here because I have so much more I want to share with you guys, but uh, we also collect manga. Uh, mo most of our collection is focused on American comics, but manga, which is Japanese comics, is immensely popular. And we now have amassed the largest collection of manga outside of Japan. We have a partnership with the Kyoto Manga Museum in Tokyo, in Tokyo, in Japan, uh, in Kyoto, and um, they send us all of their duplicate materials. So we've got over 20,000 volumes of manga, um, as well as some really cool pieces of original art, like this piece from Astro Boy by Osama Tezuka. Um, the last massive collection that I want to tell you guys a little bit about, and it's actually the theme of an exhibit that I'm curating right this moment that opens next week that I've got a lot more work to do on, is uh, a collection that is the largest one that we ever received and that maybe maybe any library system has received uh, uh, um, in the United States. This is a, um, uh, a collection that was amassed by this gentleman here in the photo named Bill Blackbeard. Uh, it contains 2.5 million comic strip clippings that he personally clipped out and amassed in his home. Um, Bill Blackbeard was an avid uh, newspaper comics collector and fan his entire life. And in the 1960s, he was living out in California when he found out about something going on in the world of libraries in the United States that is now considered to be a somewhat regrettable thing that librarians did. And that was the um, invention and implementation of microfilm and microform, uh, microforms, which could be microfilm or microfiche. I don't expect the younger folks on this call to know what this is, but basically at a time before ebooks and 
modern digitization, libraries were faced with this serious issue of running out of space on their shelves. Um, they had nowhere to put the new stuff when, you know, with all the old stuff that was taking up room. So this thing called microfilm was event invented. Basically, libraries would identify the biggest, bulkiest items on their shelves, which were often, as pictured here, huge bound volumes of historic newspapers that would then be laid out on a table and with a camera, a photograph would be taken of every single page of that newspaper. And the idea was that if a patron came in and wanted to look at and look at and study that particular newspaper, rather than lugging out one of these giant old tomes of, of newspapers, the patron could request this microfilm, which was a tiny film that would be put through a, basically like a projector and they could look at a screen and scroll through it to read to read and study that newspaper. It seemed like a brilliant, again, early digitization idea. But the reasons that we know now that this was a really regrettable thing is um, one microfilm was black and white photography. So all of the color information on these beautiful Sunday comics pages in particular was completely lost when it was microfilmed. Two, microfilm is super. Um, uh, you know, it's film. It's super conducive to getting, you know, covered in fingerprints and scratches and, and torn up once it's used a bunch by patrons. Often the photography itself would be really high contrast or really the contrast would be off and the material couldn't be read very easily. Um, but the top reason that this all was not a great idea was that after libraries all over the world, including the Library of Congress, like every major um, library in the United States, started microfilming their collections, they saved these tiny films and threw millions of historic documents in the garbage. So to get back to Bill Blackbeard, this guy realizes long before anyone else what a bad idea this was. And with his wife and some friends starting in the 1960s, started to drive around the United States collecting this material um, from libraries that were discarding it and filling his house with it. Over his, over his life, he amassed 2.5 million comic strip clippings. He formed a nonprofit uh, and that he called the San Francisco Academy of Comic Art. Again, it was really just his house, but he uh, wrote some of the earliest and most essential books about comic strip history. He also would open his house to anyone who wanted to come in and study this collection and uh, give them 24 hour access to the work. Uh, his goal was to collect every single newspaper comic that had ever been published. The entire home, which was a large home, <laughs> was floor to ceiling stacks of newsprint. Um, the only room that didn't have any paper in it was the bathroom because he was worried about how the water would affect the newsprint, which we're grateful for. Um, but otherwise, it was a tiny path from, you know, the bed to the kitchen to, you know, uh, the bathroom. So uh, quite a large collection. He started doing this in the 1960s. Flash forward to 1998. In 1998, he uh, got evicted from, from this home. He, he had been renting this home uh, since then. Um, and so he contacted us at OSU when he found out he needed to get everything out immediately. So this is him much later in life. Um, he contacted us. We were very familiar with his collection. Again, he was, despite being, you know, this, you might think of kind of crazy collector guy, he really had a vision and it was quite organized. And, and what he had done was a, a, an incredible thing. And so we were very aware of what he was doing. And he asked if we'd take on the collection and we said yes. And so in 1998, it arrived at our doors in our previous smaller basement facility in six semi trucks. Um, we've been cataloging this collection since 1998. This is now the 25th anniversary of it arriving here, which is why we're doing this exhibition about it. And we're about 40% through the process of cataloging the entire thing. So it's a it's a lifelong work, but that's just a little plug for this exhibit that we're going to be uh, uh, mounting quite soon that shows some of the highlights of the kind of work that we have found in this in this awesome collection. So just a, a couple more mentions of types of work that we collect and exhibit. Um, we collect um, mini comics and zines. These are DIY, you know, self-published materials. Um, <clears throat> we're really happy to have this great collection by from Diskette Press, which is based in Michigan and publishes exclusively com uh, mini comics by um, trans and non-binary cartoonists. We also have collections of, you know, periodicals and, and humor magazines 
that, you know, are precursors to things like Mad Magazine. Um, and the earliest works we have in our collection date back all the way to the 1600s. Uh, that would include British and French prints and things like this. <clears throat> And lastly, we've got a massive collection, like I mentioned earlier, of ephemera. So it's not just works on paper, it's also objects. Um, we have to sometimes reel in what we're able to collect in this area because merchandising has just exploded, especially over the past um, couple of decades. But these are a few examples of the types of merchandise and ephemeral pieces that we consider um, really important and also um, exhibit worthy. So the piece on the far left is from the Larry Ivy collection, and it's uh, what we believe to be one of the first handmade cosplay costumes that dates back to the 1950s. Uh, Larry Ivy was one of the founders of comics fandom. We have his collection at our library. And back in the 1940s and 50s, he was um, hand sewing um, costumes based on his favorite comic book characters. And then he and his friends would reenact the comic book stories in Central Park and other locations and film them on Super 8 films. So we actually have the films that he created um, you know, doing this cosplay way back then, uh, as well as the costumes themselves and, and things from the rest of his career. Um, the item next to that, Nell Brinkley hair waivers. Um, these are, uh, these are, how do I explain this? It's sort of uh, little hair curlers that were created um, back in the 1920s so that young women at the time could do their hair to look like the creations of the cartoonist Nell Brinkley, who is one of the famous flapper cartoonists working in the 19-teens and 20s. Um, her style of drawing women in the newspapers was so influential that young women wanted to look like her cartoon characters and you could actually do your hair like them. Uh, next to that is um, a Patty Joe doll. Um, that is the very first upscale African-American girl doll, and it was created based on a licensed image from a comic strip that was created by an artist named Jackie Orms, who was one of the first um, Black women to have, she was the first Black women woman with a nationally distributed comic strip back in the 1940s and 50s. She licensed the image of one of her creations, and it became this Patty Joe doll. So uh, again, it's not comics, but it's got that uh, connection that is really essential. And then to the right is a Na uh, Nancy mascot costume from the 1980s. Um, it's quite large. We have to be careful sometimes about accepting things like this because they take out up so much space, but they do have, have great use in exhibits. And also sometimes we'll have someone put it on for a program. <laughs> so, um, I wanted to, you know, point out our um, website, cartoons.osu.edu. Uh, if you guys go onto our homepage here, this is where you can find out everything that we've got going on. Um, you can explore our collections and see um, uh, our digital image database that I mentioned that has over 30,000 high-res images in it, and then find records for every aspect of our collection. Um, as you'll see on the right under search our collections, um, Unfortunately, our databases are a little clunky. There's no what we would call federated search where you can find everything in one place. They're broken out instead into format. So there's a different um, our, there's a different database for the archive material, for the art, for the books, et cetera. Um, but you can also check out what events we've got going on and exhibits as well. Um, so I wanted to kind of wrap things up by talking a little bit about some of the specific challenges in curating uh, cartoon and comic art exhibitions. And as you can see from this list, there are many. <laughs> so um, the the first one I want to I want to talk a little bit about is the concept of high versus low art. So uh, I, I think the point has probably come across a, a few times in my talk here that this is a real issue and has been since we were um, being founded and when, when OSU libraries initially rejected our founding collection. Um, it has been a you know 40 plus year struggle to try to get Ohio State and also the general public to um, to pay the kind of attention that we feel is deserved to comics. Um, uh, a great example when talking in particular about um, exhibiting comic art comes from um, someone like Roy Lichtenstein. So uh, people still to this day have a really hard time wrapping their heads around the fact that comics uh, could or should be preserved in an institution, let alone exhibited in a museum. 
Um, but when something is, you know, taken and repurposed the way that Roy Lichtenstein uh, did for his pop art paintings, you know, he was taking uh, this artwork directly from actual cartoonists who were, you know, paid barely, <laughs> very, very little <laughs> to create these works that he then, you know, repurposed into fine art paintings. So what is it about the one on the left that makes it um, not worthwhile and not worth exhibiting or collecting versus the one on the right that is worth selling for millions of dollars? And, you know, these issues of high ver versus low art come up a lot for us. Um, one of the things about it is, of course, the... Um, uh, uh, the mass, um, the mass creation of it, you know, something on the left was made in mass and something on the right is a one of a kind piece of artwork, even if it was um, just uh, ripped off by someone else's artwork. So uh, we often deal with that um, at our library, um, people being confused about why this stuff is worth saving. Um, I mentioned briefly earlier that we don't have a docent program, but we actually did for a little while and we had to close it down because we could not get enough docents um, to uh, feel comfortable um, working with our material. Um, a lot of, I know there might be some docents on this call. Um, a lot of docents who we were working with were, were um, we were sharing a program with the Wexner Center for the Arts, which is a major contemporary art museum on campus. So they were kind of lending their docents to the Billy Ireland to give tours of our exhibitions. And the docents found it extremely um, difficult to engage people with comic art, um, in part because what they often did at, as at the other museum was, you know, stand in front of a piece and ask people what they see and have them observe and interpret it. In comics, that's there's a little bit less of that, you know, um, it's much more direct. And uh, so we had we had some challenges there and they found it hard to how to how to talk about the work, things like that. There's also this other aspect of the high versus low art thing um, when it comes to comics of a lot of cartoonists um, view the final piece, the printed publication to be like, that's the thing. The original art, the drawing itself is sort of taken out of context, doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, further down here, I mentioned displaying single pages versus complete stories. It's kind of challenging sometimes, especially space-wise in a museum to wanna show work from an artist and you're showing a single page that doesn't really make sense when taken out of context of a longer comic book or graphic novel story. Um, some of the other issues uh, here that I'll mention, the lack of surviving original art. So I talked about this a little bit with that piece of Windsor McKay art, where it went, you know, so much of it was about to go in the garbage. The vast majority of this stuff has. So one of the reasons that that Bill Blackbeard collection is so important and so well regarded, that massive collection of newspaper clippings, is because, you know, since this was a, not a, a valued um, format, after a lot of these early newspaper comics in particular were published in the late 1800s and early 1900s, once the thing went to print, the original art was painted over or crumpled up and used for kindling. Like no one was putting it in museums. There was no, no one, was, there was no collector's market for this type of thing. And so these fragile newspaper clippings that libraries had saved that they were then throwing in the trash are literally the only copies that have survived thanks to that man's collection. So we often have to rely on those reproductions to show things because the original art is just completely gone. Um, another challenge would be the uh, lack of credit given to creators. Um, this is a particularly big um, issue with um, more mainstream comics, which were done in like an assembly line, uh, meaning that there's a different person that works doing the lettering, the coloring, the writing, things like that. Um, especially in the early days, a lot of cartoonists um, uh, were not credited in the publications themselves. And that's the case for animation as well. Um, formats of work can be uh, challenging for us as we move into a web comics age where that's really um, uh, one of the main ways that people are creating work is uh, I was born digital. We haven't quite tackled how we're going to start representing that in our museum, but I know that in our archive, what used to be receiving a, you know, semi truck of work when a cartoonist passed away, now we receive sometimes a hard drive of someone's entire collection. So that's one of the one of the challenges we're facing. Inclusivity is a huge one. So comics are a vastly male white male dominated field still to this day though that is really is is starting to change for sure. But um when we when we 
curate exhibits, you know, we want to be inclusive. We want to show diversity. And sometimes we just can't because there isn't any. And so that can be a, a real challenge for us. Um, stakeholders and identifying audience. So uh, a major thing that I, that I failed to mention is that there's actually no comics program at Ohio State. Um, so we don't have a direct uh, department that we partner with. The classes that I teach tend to be um, through their one-off sessions where I invite in um, course classes from any department across OSU. Maybe it's the Jewish studies department who want to learn about how Jewish men had such a major impact on the comic book field, or a women's studies class interested in women's roles in comic strips throughout years. Um, but there's no direct department that works with us um, all the time. So that can be a little bit of a challenge. And when it comes to identifying public audiences, we try to, uh, especially for our exhibits, work with community groups or campus groups that have a, a particular subject interest in whatever we're displaying. I mentioned the um, single pages versus complete stories already. Uh, funding and competition. So this is uh, this is new, a new issue for us. So I mentioned earlier that we were really one of the first. Um, ooh, my dog is barking. Sorry, we were one of the first uh, people, first institutions to really pay attention to this kind of material, and that is now no longer the case. So um, in recent years, uh, Columbia University has started to also collect this kind of material, and um, there are a few other institutions that have as well. And one of the challenges that we face is um, being able to pay cartoonists for their collections um, you, with our fairly um, meager acquisitions budget. Um, I don't know if anyone has heard about this, but our, our now our biggest com competitor is George Lucas. Uh, George Lucas is opening a museum of narrative art out in California. And uh, one of the biggest branches of his museum is comic art and he has George Lucas Star Wars money so uh, he's been uh, buying out the collections from cartoonists that we had otherwise uh, been hoping to to preserve the work from. This is one of these double-edged swords where we're thrilled to see these cartoonists getting the money that they deserve for these collections. The, the unfortunate part is um, the, some of these institutions are private institutions. They don't have, um, there's no public access for research to be done with the material. So it gets kind of, uh, you know, locked away, um, in a different way than it would if it were at the Billy Ireland. Um, and then lastly, label text in an academic setting. So, um, this is something that maybe comes up at, at Boston College galleries, um, Museum uh, uh, label writing is often, or contemporary art museum label writing is often very different than the type of label writing that gets done uh, in academic settings. Uh, this is probably my favorite meme that I've ever seen related to uh, label writing or museum work in general. Um, I myself am a librarian and an academic, and it can be sometimes really hard to pull back out of the um, wanting to give all the information possible and all the history possible like I've been doing in this talk and to remember that you know less is sometimes more in a museum setting and uh, uh, so that's that's one of the things that's um, hard not for us uh, not for us particularly because of being a comics museum but because of being an academic museum we're we're, we're a teaching and learning institution we want to make sure we're giving it the all the information um, to uh, you know students who may be coming through, but we also have to balance that with, um, you know, audience uh, patience and attention span. Um, the way that that does relate to being a comics museum in particular is since we're a comics museum, there's a lot to read just on the page itself. So adding on to that with our label text can sometimes be um, a little bit uh, uh, hard to navigate. So I realize I'm so far over time, you guys, and I'm really sorry about that. Um, but as hopefully you've been, you've enjoyed this talk. I would love to take questions. Uh, I'd also love to hear from you. If if we do have to end um, before you get to ask anything, feel free to uh, shoot me an email. Um, you can follow us online uh, on Facebook as our full name, Billy Ireland Cartoon Library Museum or on Twitter and Instagram at Cartoon Library. Uh, we have, a, I think, a pretty awesome Instagram account where we post all kinds of, you know, cool stuff from our collection. So definitely check us out on there and join our mailing list as well.
Thank you. <laughs> so I think if you guys, if anyone has a question that they don't want to turn on their um, microphone to ask, you can pop it in the chat. Otherwise, uh, I don't know what the best way is to. Absolutely. To I, I agree. If you, uh, you can also unmute yourself if you want to simply ask a question and um, we can also, you know, welcome just conversation or comments or thoughts. Um, uh, Caitlin, I, I have a, a quick question. Um, I, I am very familiar with the fact that in the early days, uh, comic artists sort of ended up where it ended up. It, it, people, some people threw it away. Here in Boston, I know Boston University has all of Al Cap's letters because he just gave them to them. There was no, there was no um, real, there were no norms. One thing that has happened, of course, in, since the 1970s, I think, is there has be there has become a robust market for people buying uh, original art as fine art. Mm -hmm. But it is it's also a film a, a, a market that has no clear norms. People don't it's it's not like going to a gallery. You know, people go to comic conventions, they carry their these pages around in big binders and, and there's not a lot of protection for these things, but they have at least been uh they have at least been uh preserved and they're now starting to become extremely valuable, mm -hmm. uh, particularly during the pandemic certain cartoonists like Chris Ware, Jaime Hernandez, their work, the value of their work has gone through the roof. I wanted to know what, if you might speak to how uh, you interact with that, if or, or do you interact at all with the community of um, collectors uh, and, and, and what do you think about how that's changed in the last few years? Yeah, that is a great question. So one thing that you may have noticed when I was showing um, different like aspects of the original art collection we have is that there was not an example of mainstream comic book art in there. And that is because, um, yes, as, as, as John says, the collector's market for that kind of work in particular is unbelievably competitive and uh, this stuff has skyrocketed in value. Um, we, since we are donation-based, um, rarely receive donations of mainstream comic book art. If you're not familiar with this term, this means um, comic book art that was published by like DC and Marvel comics. So the kind of the big, the big name superhero type stuff, very, very hard for us to get our hands on. Um, I think that uh, it's a, it's a tough thing because much like the history of comics and the preservation of comics collections, like what Bill Blackbeard did, we really, it really is all thanks to fans of this work. Like the earliest histories of comic strip art and comic book art were all entirely written by fans. Um, there was no, until recently, no programs to go for the study of comics. And um, again, it's a double-edged thing because we're so grateful that the fans really were the historians and the people who, who um, created the documentation for this. But because it was so, it's such a white male dominated field, those were not really um, often holistic uh, representations of the of of the creators out there. So much of the writing was about the artists that some particular fans were super interested in, and there are entire cartoonists who have been left out of the canon of comics history, which is something that um, that we try to correct in some of our exhibits and scholarship. But that's that's kind of an aside. But um, but speaking to the, um, you know, I don't know if it's, I, I'm going to, I wish this wasn't the case, but I think that it's because of the popularity of the mainstream comics movies that the collector's market for this material has gotten so unbelievably high. Um, but it is also in part thanks to museums now doing exhibits of this kind of work. If it's exhibit worthy, you know, it's going to be uh, collecting worthy, um, especially for folks like that, some of the more indie comics cartoonists that you mentioned. So I'm not, I'm not sure if that answers it, but, uh, but generally, um, yeah, you're absolutely right that it's just getting to be more and more of a, um, a, a collector's market and competitive field. Um, Caitlin, I want to thank you so much for this wonderful talk. I am um, full of admiration for you, um, not only for having built up this museum in the last 40 years, 
to one of the principal um, mainstays of, of cartoon art and the largest in the world. Um, that's really quite an accomplishment. I also want to thank you um, for imparting so much information um, <laughs> in, in this short period of time. It was just a wonderful talk. And um, I, I understand all the challenges you have. There's one challenge, though, that, I, that um, you didn't miss mention and um, that I'm curious about. And you can tell that I'm a museum person myself. Um, what about conservation? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So we, um, since we're part of the university library system, we have, uh, uh, we all share resources and we have, there is an entire um, conservation team at OSU libraries. So um, it's not located within the Billy Ireland. We're all kind of, it's a massive campus. And so they're in a different facility, but we send works to them regularly that need um, preservation and, and restoration. Um, we have to be very careful about what we can accept. When we were first building up the collections, we really kind of said yes to everything. And um, we've now had to uh, create an acquisitions committee where any, any possible donation or addition to the collection has to get approved by this committee. And one of the biggest things that that committee asks about is how has this stuff been stored <laughs> and where has it been stored before it's coming to us? Um, that has become uh, even more of a uh, crucial issue for us um, after we uh, had accepted a collection a few years ago that had some serious mold issues on it. And we currently, um, we have we have new practices um, since we've been in our new building where we have sort of a, um, this maybe this is too much information, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. We have like a, a dirty room or a receiving room where connection, collections first come into. Even if something appears to be absolutely perfect, it stays in that room. Our conservators come over there. They assess it to make absolutely sure there's no pest issues. There's no mold issues. Um, there's air scrubbers running in that room all the time. Oftentimes this work's been kept in someone's house where they were a smoker or whatever. We just want to kind of clear out that smell. And before it gets integrated into our collection, it's fully assessed by our conservators to make sure that it's okay. Um, beyond that, um, there are issues that we run into just with stuff degrading over time, despite keeping it in our, you know, climate controlled facilities. Um, and we're able to send stuff over to conservation if there are tears that need to be fixed or, you know, bindings that need to be restored and things like that. Well, thank you. Thank you. I mean, I'm glad that you have so much, um, so much access. Yeah. To the library's conservation labs. That's a real. It is a huge help, especially when it comes to exhibitions. That's yeah. Huge help. I have a couple of students on here. Uh, I know one of uh, one of whom actually um, worked with John on the, on the current exhibition. And I'm wondering um, if any of them, these are students studying about museums in general. Um, and I'm wondering if any of them might have some specific questions for you about your curatorial role. If not, I also have a question. <laughs> um, I, I'm curious uh, about, you know, the uh, Billy Ireland Museum being a part of a university and if you see that as contributing or, you know, making it more of a challenge as opposed to, you know, hypothetically thinking about this museum as a, you know, independent, say, public museum or private museum. Um, if that relationship with the university offers anything in particular. Yeah, so um, there, there are pluses and minuses. So OSU, if folks aren't familiar, is uh, I believe the second or third largest university in the country. We have over 70,000 students. This is a massive, massive uh, institution, which also means that it's a massive bureaucracy. <laughs> so, you know, as, as mentioned with our conservation um, lab and, and department that we can work with, 
it being a huge place means there's all kinds of great resources and infrastructure um, that we have access to, but it also means that there's a ton of red tape and that there are things that we want to do that we can't always do maybe as fast as we want to. Um, a place like Ohio, Ohio State is weirdly annoyingly focused on branding and so you know we have a certain idea of how we want museum materials to look but since we're part of a university library within a university they sometimes want us to look the same as the you know the the department of dentistry and stuff so <laughs> there there are elements like that that make it very frustrating to work within um a university uh setting but for the most part, it is uh, it is a tremendous blessing. I've worked for much smaller um, institutions before, and while it's great to be able to you know take that more kind of DIY approach and and have complete creative freedom and things like that, the actual funding to to do what needs to be done and do it well is is what is what matters the most. And so um, so overall, it's really wonderful, and we just hope that there. Are, um, Again, over the 40 years that we've been here, it's been an uphill battle. Um, it started to change more drastically re, uh, in recent years, in part, I think, because now that we have competition, OSU is generally recognizing like, oh, wait, we've got something really special here. We should really uh, highlight this 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 wonderful uh, collection and institution we have um, since places like Columbia are suddenly wanting to do this, too. And um and so we've gotten more attention from them, but even uh, when we moved into our new facility, which was 2013, the cost of opening this new building, um, the whole renovation was $14 million. OSU gave us 1 million of that. So the other 13 million was privately fundraised by mm -hmm. myself and my colleagues. And it was thanks to families like the Schultz family and the Billy Ireland family, and then countless individual donations that we were able to do it but uh again it's sort of this um this tough spot so uh overall though very very grateful to be part of a, of a major university and especially because it allows us to be you know plugged into such a wide variety of of departments and other disciplines that maybe wouldn't have seen a direct connection with with comics and their subject matter but we're able to kind of fold them in and, and teach them about it thank you Well, if, does anybody else have any questions, comments, thoughts? If not, then um, I think we can um, call it an evening, so to speak. And uh, again, thank you, Caitlin, for joining us. Um, and thank you, everyone, um, for being with us this evening. Thanks so much for having me. Sorry again, I went over. And um, yeah, come visit the Billy Ireland. <laughs> Terrific. Thank you right. so much. Thank you. Bye.